And the HVAC, as I was saying earlier, suddenly did something weird 30 minutes ago. So we're feeling a late summer heat at the moment. So apologies for that. But nonetheless, this afternoon is going to be so wonderful because it is my delight and honor to welcome our second guest for the Anti-Racist Education Series. We are welcoming Fariel Atif. Probably doesn't even need an introduction. I'm sure many of us have seen her around campus. Um, but we're so wonderful and delighted to welcome you here today. And two of the 18 things that you are part of, <laughs> plus probably thousands more, is that you are president of UL's International Student Council and vice president and advo advocacy chair of UL's graduate student organization, plus many more things. <laughs> so, um, so far, you welcome to the second, the second session. Um, is there anything you, else you'd like to add about the other many activities that you do on campus? Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, I'm really thankful for Hilliard Museum for just organizing this very much needed conversation and making me part of it. It makes me feel so special. And uh, my friend, Dr. Smith, Kelly, I call her Kelly. Thank you so much, Kelly. What a wonderful museum educator we have. Couldn't think of anyone better. So thank you, Kelly, for doing what you're doing here and everything else. Um, so, and my friends, a lot of you are here. Thank you so much for your time. Uh, so yes, other than the president of the National Student Council and the vice president of GSO, I'm also a presidential student ambassador. I write for uh, Lacadian yearbook. Um, I'm also a Secretary of International Student Affairs with Student Government Association, and there are other, other things. <laughs> Let's just give oh, it to that. That's wonderful. Well, as with uh, last week uh, with Professor Kwana McClung, and each of these will be available digitally, so if you would like a digital access to any of these four sessions, um, I can make sure you're in touch with that. Um, but a continuation of really beginning uh, with bringing some art into the space. And so each of the guests were um, invited to select something on view, but that caught their attention for whatever reason. Um, and so far, y'all selected the following pieces that are both um, on view, and each of these works are in the South Arts Gallery downstairs. Um, and so the prompt and invitation was very simple. It was just simply pick something that catches your attention. And one act of this is really the practice of looking at something from someone else's point of view and the value of that. So do you want to say a little bit more about why you chose these pieces? Um, yes. First of all, I feel like, okay, yesterday I came to um, the museum to have a look at the art and we were like, okay, we have to choose a few pieces. And so I thought I would just come, walk into the gallery, look at things. I'm like, okay, Kelly, this looks interesting or that looks interesting. And I just went down, walk, you know, looking at the gallery, a few pieces, and um, saw a few things, thought about a few things. And then I had a conversation with Kelly, and very moving conversation. Yeah, I think we were there for about 40, 40 minutes or an hour. And just like how, at a personal level, these resonated with you at different times of your lives or different aspects of your, your experience. So um, since this conversation is also about my immigrant experience here, um, I chose a few of these um, four, actually, pieces of arts. And um, Every single thing, you know, the, the amazing thing about art is there is an artist, they have something in their mind and then they paint. And then as us, as viewers, we just go and look at those art and then we look at those art from our own point of view, our own experiences, and then it's just, it's such an amazing um, a platform of expression. So when I looked at these art, and it's so funny that then I read about it and what they were thinking when they were painting it, um, it was so amazing for me and fascinating for me to think about from artist's point of view why they painted this and then how I saw this art and how I put myself in these paintings. So, this one I really encourage you to go down and have a look at it closely because uh, the picture definitely, you know, does not do the justice. 
But when I looked at this art piece, the first thing came to my mind, um, me as an immigrant. Um, as an immigrant, you live in this very liminal space. Oh my God, like now, come on. We love you, Faryal. You like we've got an audience of fans. We are so happy to have you here today. This is a very special audience, by the way. Just thank you so much, you guys, to be here. Um, so yeah, so as just an immigrant experience, and it's so funny that I just use the word liminal and Dr. Ingram <laughs> and. <laughs> A word that I learned from her, a word that we use in every single of our class. <laughs> and literally, um, learning that word, I realized that as an immigrant, we also live on a liminal space. So um, someone, I was someone or my family someone before moving here and who we are now. Um, I lost a part of me. Y'all, we are going to cry a lot because I'm a cry baby. <laughs> So I lost a part of me that I don't think I will ever get back, but I also um, become someone else. But in becoming that someone else, I still live on this liminal space that I think I will always live. And so when I looked at this painting, um, well, it's a piece of art, actually. If you see, there is uh, some piece of furniture there. There is a suitcase there. Um, obviously, looking at the suitcase, first thing come to my mind is every single thing, you know, every single thing, my life, how everything I packed. Um, we moved here six years ago in 2016, September 2016. I'm originally from Pakistan. I was born, brought up there, went to school, college there. My family is from Pakistan. I was married in Pakistan. My husband is from Pakistan. And then um, we got married uh, after that one and a half month. Fun fact, my husband always wanted to go out to study abroad. His father did not want him to go. So his father, one way of him thought that he will hold him back is he decided to not support him financially. So if you will not support financially, you will not buy him a plane ticket or something. He cannot go. No, you can have ways. If you put something, you can do it. My husband, without telling anyone, even I was getting married, I did not know. Come on, now, lie. So he um, was doing his master's at that time in Pakistan, and he applied for PhD in Malaysia. Nobody knew, and I guess he also did not know that it's even possible that he will go out. And after one and a half month of us newly married, I remember that day like very vividly. He came home uh, with, a, with a paper, it was acceptance letter from the university in Malaysia that he applied, and he showed all of us like, I applied for PhD, I got a scholarship, I'm leaving, bye. And I was like, what? Um, and then he left. Um, we were married in January, and I think in April he left. So um, I live with my in-laws for a year and keep bugging him and call me <laughs> or divorce. I will divorce you, just call me. And as a PhD student, you know, it's, it's not easy, it's hard. And he tried his best. And one and a half year, I think after one and a half year, I joined him. So we moved to Malaysia. Um, I was on a dependent visa with him. We lived there for five years when he completed his PhD during that time. And then he applied for his was doctorate and we moved to Atlanta, Georgia. So we went to Atlanta, Georgia. He was at Emory University there and we lived there. And again, I was with him as his uh, dependent. My visa did not allow me to work earlier when I was in Malaysia. Uh, my visa again did not allow me to work this time when we were there. So he worked as a postdoc. And after five years, just like every five years, we live on a five-year plan. <laughs> but we are good. This is a sixth year now. <laughs> so we are safe. <laughs> So after five years, we moved back um, to Malaysia. Now this time to a different state. Um, he finished his postdoctorate. He was offered a faculty position there. So we moved back thinking that um, it probably be a good thing. You know, it's not easy in academia to get a faculty position. So let's go have a few years. And always the idea was to come back here, uh, because when we were in Atlanta, it just felt like home. 
if you meet my husband, he will say, the minute I put my foot on US soil, I just felt like it was home. He always says this. So we had a great experience there. Um, this time when we moved back, I was able to have my work permit. And I started working in a, um, in a school there. And I end up working there six years. And then after first year, I was uh, promoted as the academic coordinator. So I worked there six years as an academic coordinator, working with students um, who were from different nationalities. Um, in Malaysia, you have the Malay, uh, the majority Malay population. So we have the Malay children there. And then you have the uh, biggest minority, Chinese. So I have the Chinese students. And then you have this uh, North Indian, South Indian, sorry, who came to the, the island uh, to work on the rubber farms. And then they stayed there and settled there. So all these three different populations. And um, all of that, anyway, just worked there. And then six years ago, um, we moved here. And this time, we chose UL Lafayette and Louisiana. Um, so all of this while, one thing that remained constant in my family is the suitcase. <laughs> suitcase. And six years ago when we came here, nobody believed it, but literally we came here with four suitcases, like eight suitcases. Everyone had a one hand carry and one luggage. And three of those luggage are mine. Don't tell my husband, but three were mine. <laughs> even though I, even though I sacrifice a lot throwing my things, my shoes, and my clothes. So it was really sentimental, that suitcase. Um, but then the other thing that really fascinates me is that furniture, this old looking furniture, and then you're trying to make it look and better with the new paint. Just like you know, a life of an immigrant, you have so much before coming here, and then you just paint this new life. You just try to learn new things, new ways. And while doing that, you just come to a place that's where I feel like I'm in a liminal space where you try to learn all these new ways, new language, new culture, meet new people, make new friends, your life change, your children grow in a different environment, they are different people. And somehow in between when you go back home, you just feel different. You know, when you go back home and the same home, the same people that you always know, the place you grow up, is just a different place now. So you are a stranger in your own place and you're also in stranger's new place. I will always be looked, whenever people see me, they always ask me, where are you from? Um, so, and they will always ask me and that's nothing wrong with that. I don't take it as like, you know, but, um, so when I look at this painting, it's just reminded me of life as an immigrant. And uh, all these different colors, all these different things that you paint on yourself and carry on. So that's something that really stuck to me about this painting. OK, I need to drink a sip of water, because we have to cry a little bit more. <laughs> Eight suitcases. Oh my goodness. Um, well, I think back when we first were in conversation about you appearing in the series, you told me that when you came to Louisiana, you went, you moved to New Iberia first. So, right? It wasn't even Lafayette. And we know Lafayette to New Iberia, and I'm not even from Louisiana originally. That's like two worlds, it feels like to me, <laughs> between here and that 20-minute drive. So what was it like to, uh, to live in New Iberia and, and that neighbor that you had? We had some conversations <laughs> about her. First of all, you guys, I love New Iberia. <laughs> I really, truly do. I don't know what you think about New Iberia. I love New Iberia. I met some amazing people. I have a really great friend. I have a family we celebrate Thanksgiving with. So nobody say anything about New Iberia. <laughs> so yes, um, so when we moved, and I think there are two incidents that really stood out, especially when I was thinking about all those experiences and this uh, series talking about racism, anti-racism, and people's beliefs and things. There were two incidents that stood out. One thing you know, I learned in my life, and I really strongly practice that um, I want people to ask me anything. So I want to be approachable enough where people will come to me. Uh, often people, I know, and we all have this, people come and say, like, hey, I want you to ask this, but I don't want to offend you. There is nothing in this world offend me. Okay. 
maybe there are one or two things. But nothing, if you have any question about me, my religion, my nationality, my background, anything, you know, and this is how we learn. This is how, if I will not open myself, and if I will not tell you my first hand experience from myself about me, um, where will you learn? And where will you get that authentic? Should I use the word authentic? <laughs> no, okay, I'm not using it, not, not authentic. But like this, just my lived experience. So I have to be open. And um, so going back to New Iberia, uh, when we moved here, so it was uh, September 2016, and you guys will remember it was right after the big flood that happened. So we were in Penang that time. Now Penang is the second largest city in Malaysia, very well developed, skyscrapers, big huge malls, bustling traffic. Um, you go to the mall, you have a Gucci and Armani and everything. Um, so just trying to give you this reference that it's a big developed place. And we lived there for six years. We came to, well, we, when, we, when we heard that, okay, we are coming to here, Lafayette. I live in Georgia for six years. I, and I'm not saying it any other way or bad. I love UL. You all know I love UL. But I had no idea what UL is. I had no idea what Lafayette is. I had no idea, which is amazing now that I think about me here. I feel like I was born here. <laughs> so, but we had no idea. So when I was told, okay, we are going to Lafayette, obviously you have to go and just Google for search, right, where are we going? And so my husband works at New Iberia Research Center. He is a microbiologist and a virologist. So he does research. Uh, so obviously New Iberia Research Center, that's what we know that we are going to. So I was here researching, okay, fine, we are going to this new place, this, this, this. And here I see Lafayette and I just see water everywhere. Because you guys had this flood and I was like, oh my God, where are we going, like what's going on here? And so we contacted people here, they were like, no, everything is okay, it happened, you guys are fine. Um, my husband's boss, now a great friend of ours, um, he um, offered his house, he was like, when you guys will come, I live in New Iberia, you can come live with me and then you see. So we were like, okay. Um, I will never, rem uh, never forget the night that when after, you know, it's like almost 40 hours, you have three flights, you have, Dr. Rose know what I'm talking about, you have this 12 hours and 14 hours flight, and fourth flight when you sit in this small tiny plane from Dallas to Lafayette, you are tired, you're cranky, you don't want to see each other, like it's bad, it's really bad. So we were tired and everything and we were coming here. Here we landed at Lafayette Airport. I think it was almost 11 or something at night. There was no one, it was the old airport. There was no one at the airport, like no one. So I was first shocked like, where is everyone? Who do we give our luggage tag to? Where is my luggage? Nobody was there. Somehow we just went, luggage just appeared. We just took our luggage. Nobody checked. <laughs> so we took all of our eight things and came out and um, we from Lafayette, and now because now I just know the area so well, but obviously I had no idea. So from Lafayette to New Iberia, we went to New Iberia, and it was the sugarcane harvesting season. So the field were up, there were no street lights, and we are going. And I was like, "What the hell? Where are we? <laughs> Where are we going? Like, what's going on?" I was just sitting, looking at my husband, like, "I hope you know. Like, what is this?" And I think the first week in New Iberia was, I would call it a cultural shock because I was still looking for like, where is the bank? Where are the offices? Where are the buildings? Like where is everyone? And then later I realized that it's a different kind of architecture. So like they have these small cute buildings where you have, you know, um, so it was great. And then I don't know, I never live in such a small town, so I, it was a weird experience at first, but then I just love it. I love living there. I, and the, what Kelly's talking about, we had this neighbor, she, bless her heart, she still lived there. Um, I have to say, I'm lucky enough to have friends from very young age to very old age. So I think she is now in her late 80s. Um, one day I was walking in front of her house, she and her daughter was painting their porch. So I just waved and she just, she was curious. She asked me, who are you, this and that. And I told her I just moved in this house. I think, I have to ask her, I think I am the first foreigner she met in her life, I'm pretty sure. 
anyway, she was very gracious, very nice. And after that, um, I, we often talk. She lived there alone with her son. And so she on, often invited me to her porch and always bring this iced tea and everything. And we are very, we are good friends now. And um, one day we were talking and she was very curious. She always talks about her church. Um, her life surrounds, you know, and all her socials and everything. And so one day um, we were talking about certain things. She asked me about my religion and I told her I'm Muslim, this and that. And she told me, and I thought it was very nice. It was, it was funny, it was cute. She said, Faryal, I have to tell you this and do not mind, but you're the first Muslim I met who is so nice. So I was like, okay, and I was like, <laughs> I was like, okay, but Miss Pat, oh, I shouldn't say her name, oh, yeah. but now we know. <laughs> so I asked her, okay, so like just curious, how many Muslims do you meet? What experiences you had? And she thought for a second, she was like, actually, you're the first Muslim I ever met. And it was just, I think, you know, and I don't think the word, you know, now we use, I just feel like we use the word races very ca casually. We, I think it's also becoming a very trendy word. I just feel like that we have to be very careful um, using this word because also checking our own personal biases, right? There is some racism, some biases we all have in ourselves, which I think we tend to ignore. So, you know, when I look at her, this sweet lady who whenever I'm there, she run inside and try to bring something to eat. She always insists to me. She even tried to tell me it's fine. This is not, a, this sausage is fine. I'm like, no, Miss Pat, I'm, I cannot eat sausage. This is not fine. <laughs> and, um, you know, she always sits and tell me about her stories, this and that. I never, I always felt and I even now feel very comfortable, very loving in her company. So for her saying something like this, I just took it as a, it coming from a place of not knowing much, you know, a place of learning. Even now she's 18, but this is maybe her chance to learn. And so that's our Miss Pat. Miss Pat did her best to take me to her church. I said, Miss Pat, I promise you I will go to the church. And I went one time, I said, I will go with you. I will sit with you, I, I don't mind, but that's it, Miss Pat. <laughs> But it's also her love. I also take it as her love. And the other thing was this wonderful family who I love dearly. They are like my second family now. So we do this home, uh, homecoming is on my mind, guys. <laughs> this um, Thanksgiving celebration, they invite us. Um, the first year they invited us because they were like, okay, we feel like that you guys have no family or something, so now we are part of your family. And this friend of mine, her father-in-law, one day at their Thanksgiving lunch, they were doing some barbecue and everything, and we were standing there. And he is one of the nicest people you meet. Um, and he was talking to something about me, and he said, okay, I'm just curious, tell me about Pakistan. So I was like, this and that, and he said, okay. And again, I'm not saying to bash him, um, and he was like, okay, I just wanted to know, do you guys have roads there? And <laughs> I know, right? I was like, not just we have roads, we have helipads on people's house. There are people rich enough, not me or my family, but I know people who have helipads who can land their own helicopters at their home. Again, coming from not a place, obviously he was not trying to embarrass me. I was invited at his house, at family, to eat on the... Uh, the table with his immediate family, right? So, I mean, those are the things, and I just feel like I've met so many interesting people throughout my life, and I just take all of these things as learning moment for myself, for them, and then I think we all grow from here. Because I know now Ms. Pat knows she knows a Muslim, it's nice, so she might see someone else and give them benefit or doubt uh, just because of me. Or, my friend know that, hey, we have roads there. <laughs> and maybe want him sometime to go and visit. 
Uh, one thing that, I mean, you're so good at is building community and bringing conversation, people together for conversation. That's a lot of work that you do, I think, as president of the International Student Council, right? You have these wonderful, are they language dinners? What are they called? Global cafes. <laughs> Global cafes, which I think are happening every week? Or? Um, we, so we started them... Um, as every last Friday of everyone, we, we organize them at the um, Globe, Division of Global Engagement. And the idea was just to, you know, do something for international community, but also for local community. I so strongly believe in, I just don't want to stay if, you know, someone come home, you know, that in that Pakistani family, I would love to meet them. But that's not my only goal to just go meet because you know, I think I am a person today, if you look back um, seven years ago or more than that, you know, it, it, I was a different person. But then all these people that I met, all these places that I go and all these experiences of cultures and festivals and, and religions, that's how, who transformed me. And I feel like this is so important for everyone. So our goal in International Student Council, doing those global cafes is not just for the international student, obviously for them to, you know, but also like involve our own community at UL and in just Journal in Lafayette to just you come and share your experiences and learn from them and you know, it's a beautiful thing. And I think it's, uh, so we were doing it once a month and become so popular and then we have so many students from different countries. We were like, if we just do like one, we may be able to do five. So then we are planning another one. And then last night we just did our first language cafe so we, uh, this is the Hispanic Heritage Month. So last night we just launched, we are calling it launch. <laughs> we just like to use this fancy words. <laughs> but uh, yeah, we launched this first language cafe. So we invited students from different uh, Hispanic origin countries and they came and they did like um, a little fun activity, you know, learning about languages and this and that. And we are planning to do more with, um, and maybe, you know, even bigger. Um, Language Cafe, by the way, is a thing internationally happening. So it is um, it started as a community project where you can just do it on a coffee shop. Or um, in my mind, I have a plan if somehow we will, and I don't know, we can talk. We have some people here who movers and shakers of the community. And this is something I think that would be a great thing for Lafayette that we can start this um, Language Cafe and we invite the community to come and join and we can find like a place like Hilliard Museum, I don't know. <laughs> and we have people who can come and um, do this. Oh, thanks for giving us a little bit more information about that because I think that is such a great way to continue the conversation. I mean, coming to this series, I appreciate each of you making time in your day to be a part of this. But really, as Faryal, you know, shows us in your like your busy daily schedules every single day is that getting out there, being in conversation, being involved in our campus community and our Lafayette community is so incredibly wonderful. It makes our life better as people, um, and, it, and it can really, you know, just make other life, other people's lives better as well. So I'm going to make more of an effort to attend these these two things, um, and so let's all keep on the lookout to to attend those two awesome uh, opportunities. Do you want to take us to some more art that you selected, or do you want to add anything else to this particular one? Or yeah, you put you already put a new one up there. Yeah, so um, the other one, I think it's also connected to the, the immigrant experience of mine or anyone else. Um, so um, recently, I think, I don't know if it's a month, probably almost a month. Uh, so we finally received our green card. So we are now the permanent resident of uh, US. Very thankful uh, for that. And I think a lot of people are in this room no, I know Dr. Grady is sitting here. She, she knew it from the very beginning. Um, I really consider, I just have to give shout out to Dr. Grady because <laughs> um, I moved to the English department because of her. I took, I don't know, almost every single of my undergrad class with Dr. Grady with you. And um, I think we have Dr. Grady, we have my beautiful, wonderful boss sitting here, Dean Lindsay. We have Dr. Honegger sitting here. Dr. Otter, we have my colleagues, we have this amazing people, um, Talwin, Candace sitting here, my friends sitting here. 
this is such an amazing community, you know. I, I don't know you guys if you know it. And oh my God, Dr. Ingram, of course. <laughs> Dr. Ingram. Come on, like you guys don't know that what it means for people like me and your support, like for you just coming here today. It's, um, it's, it's uh, because it can be a very um, lonely experience a lot of time. Um, so this painting, you know, when I look at it, it just suddenly reminded me of, again, the thing about my family. I was looking at them and I was just considering my mother and my sister. Um, it's been five years since I went back home. It's been five years since I see my mother. Oh my God, y'all, I was not planning all of this, I'm sorry. But, um, so you know, a lot of time you make these decisions, you sign these social contracts, you know the outcome, you do this, um, but obviously there are reasons in life that you make these rough, tough decisions. Um, and um, so it's been five years. I went there, I think, five years ago um, to, renew my visa and I went with my son who was a junior at that time in high school he's a junior at UL now um, it was me and him I have two sons one of them was born in US so we always call him the golden boy he's also golden he has golden hairs believe it or not <laughs> that runs in my family but like we were like uh, he's fine he doesn't care about anything but uh, my son and I, we, had, we shared the same um, visa status. We were both dependent on my husband. And five years ago, both of our visas were expired. He was in the middle of his junior year. So we had to go. You have to leave country. We have to go back to Pakistan, which is, you know, you should be happy you're going back home with your family. But for me, it was, it was hard because I was doing my undergrad at that time at UL. And um, so we both, and he was just in the middle of his junior year. So I had to go to talk to his school and send all kind of um, information to the school board. Um, and we could not give them the time because I don't know. I don't know when I go back and I apply for a visa and anyone who I know there are some international people in the audience. When you go and apply a visa from the American embassy, they don't give you a time. They don't tell you like, oh, okay, you know, you just go and you apply and whenever your interview will come. So it's just you don't know. This is a very... Um, hard process and I hate like one of the things I think um, I the minute I got my green card I was like thank god I don't have to apply for a visa um, that was the first thing came to my mind and so we went back and we stayed there for I hope I was hoping I would go there for two three weeks and come back just because of school and everything but we were there more than two months and um, my son went there after I think six years, and but he went in the circumstances when he was hearing all this conversation of we are going to uh, get the visa, and I was just sharing and knowing that nothing will happen, knowing that my husband is on H-1B, which is a very skilled worker visa, it's kind of like an invitation that we, are, we needed your expertise. So I knew everything will be fine, but then this fear, and that fear I think is just part of our life. I live in fear. Regardless of what I do, you know, this week for something, I was counting my leadership position, this and that, and I realized in six years at UL, I have 18 leadership positions. I had more than 5,000 community service hours. I had one page full of the scholarships and all kind of awards I've received. But I live in this fear of, I don't know what will happen tomorrow. Am I going to get a job? If someone's going to hire me, can someone see my worth? And I know that people always come and say, you are this, you are that, but I have this fear because I just, it's been years and years and years of living in survival and that fear just never leaves me. So I always try to do more just so that, okay, I need to check all the boxes. So when we went back and I, I feel like my son shared the same experience with me because both of us went through the same thing. He went there after six years. I wanted him to enjoy the time with his grandparents. I wanted him to enjoy the time his, with his uh, cousins and everything. He hated there. He hated. He like they were, you know, they were asking me everything is okay. Like how do we like? Because he was hating this 
idea that what if I will not able to go back. My school is there, my friends are there, my father is there, I don't, so every single thing I was like, you know, it's fine, you didn't enjoy, you know. The other thing is he also felt other, because he went there from Malaysia, he grew up in Malaysia, so he grew up speaking English because he went to an international school there because of language. So when he went there, he just felt different. And even things like, things triggered him. Like when he was speaking, he was trying to speak in the language, nobody was making fun of him. But for them, it was like, oh, look, the way he said that word. For them, it was fun. For him, it was like, oh, I did something wrong. So he would just stop speaking. And I think that experience stayed with him until now. If sometime I say, okay, we need to go back, he, was, he would rather want to go back to Malaysia. We always talk about in the house and the boys say, hey, when are we going back to Malaysia? He does not want to go back to Pakistan. And I think it came from that fear of, I mean, I was noticing him when we left and when we came to the airport, he was a different person. He was chilling and enjoying and all of that and it was just different. So, and I myself, you know, when I go back, I just feel like I'm a different person. And I want them to treat me like the way they used to treat me, but they don't. When I go, my mother wants to do extra for me. I don't want her to do extra for me. You know, sometimes they talk about something. If something is missing for cooking, she don't want me to know. If I say, oh, I want to eat this thing, and let's say something is missing, or they are out of onions or something, she don't want me to know. So because I said I need to eat this, they must cook this. So they have to send someone to go. So, but I feel like, why are you doing this to me? I'm not a guest, but I'm a guest there now. You know, it's a funny thing. <laughs> when last time I went there, I went shopping with my mother, just like to a shop. And we were doing something, and I think she was out of change or something, and I was very proudly, I, I remember when I was going back, I wanted to have whatever change I had, you know, when you come back, here's some leftover currency, so I took that currency with me, knowing that I will use it, I went there, and she needed something, and I was like, wait, I have change, so I took that change out, I put it on the counter, you will not believe it, the shopkeeper look at me, look at my mother, and they laugh, they were not using that coin anymore. <laughs> And they were like, okay, you're not from here. Um, so I was like, dang, okay. <laughs> but it's just like those kind of experiences, you know. Um, so then when I look at this painting, I just looked at my mother and my sister that everything is same, they're same. And they're looking at, <laughs> I'm sorry you guys, I didn't mean to do that. But they're looking at this sky, they're looking at me and I look at this other painting and I just see myself and you can see the difference from this one and then this one, I am different. And I'm very happy and don't, don't, don't take this as, um, I'm very, very thankful um, of all of you, of this community, of this new life, but I think that um, part of you as an immigrant that you miss, you just, you know, never get back. And then, when I look at this, really it reminded me of my son. Um, again, because of all of this that we went through, um, and he went through because he did not get his um, green card until now. So again, again the fear, again you have to survive, right? Again the survival, they do your best do your best, you have to have, and I see like how I am different, I'm a different parent with two of my children. I don't have that fear with my other son who is a citizen. If you see my son, and we, we always joke about him, that his, um, his uh, transcript, his school um, his report card is very boring because it's, it has all A's in it, <laughs> it's, there's no color in it, because he was just not allowed to. And I think somehow he learned, he knew, and he was like, you know, because like you cannot, you have very few opportunities, very few options, and you make sure that you avail every single one of them. You cannot, you cannot receive an academic scholarship even though you graduated as a valedictorian right here in Lafayette High. 
you made a 33 on your ACT. I made him do his ACT test six times, and I felt horrible. But I was like, no, you have to, because if not, you will not get the academic scholarship. You all, and I'm saying you all now. <laughs> <laughs> so six years ago, I came here. I, when we were moving from Malaysia, I was like, OK, since we are moving, I need to um, go and uh, try this time and get my education. I applied in West. Somebody is so funny. Somebody, um, a friend of mine, they know that we are planning to go back. Before my husband could find his position, so the, the team he was working in um, Atlanta doing his research, they moved here to NIRC. We did not know that. So he was looking for and talking to different people. Meanwhile, a friend of mine told me, she said, oh, you know what? I know that you guys are going back and you're thinking of going back to school. She said, you know what? There is this recruiter from Western Michigan University is here. And they have a really great program for international students. Maybe you want to talk to him. And he is going. I remember she said he's leaving tomorrow. So she said, we cannot meet because he's leaving. But maybe you can call him. I call this recruiter. I need to go find, actually, on their website <laughs> and tell him this now. I call him and say, hey, this is this, and I'm interested. He was like, yeah, we have a great education, College of Education program. You should apply. I applied that week. One thing about me is I'm a go-getter. If I need to do something, I would do it. I don't wait. So I applied. And I, before my husband could get his anything about job, I got admission in Western Michigan University in their graduate school program. And they gave me a, they call it a graduate gold award. I have those papers. Sometimes I say, I, I will never throw them, because that would make me feel so special. They gave me that. And I told my husband, I got, I mean, obviously, he knew it. We were doing it together. But then that same week, he got this offer from UL. And I mean, he is. I have, I have to give him his, his job, um, like, I, I'm looking for the right word. So I think one of the idea was that since we are going to a university, it can be UL Lafayette, why not, if, you know? So I declined my admission at the Western Michigan University, and I was like, since we are going to UL, I will apply here. We came here, I applied at UL, I was declined. Grad school declined. We always tell Dr. Kaiser, you decline, Dr. Kaiser. But obviously, it was not their fault. It was the way our system is. I was applying in College of Education, and our College of Education have their own way and call it the, the courses that they accept. Um, at that time, I did not realize because I was bitter and I was angry. And now that when I look back and think with the logic, I can see um, you know, the reasons behind it. Um, so my admission was declined. I was told that you don't have enough credit. You have to go back to school. Go back to school. You're telling me to go back to do undergrad. Um, so I think it took me six months. I was not accepting that decision. But finally, when I realized that this is the only way, uh, or else I'll just sit home doing nothing, so I decided that, OK, I need to go back to school. I applied in undergrad. They called me and they were like, well, you don't have college algebra. We need college algebra for you to have undergraduate admission at UL. That's a requirement. Now I know. <laughs> so I went to SLCC, took my college algebra there, came back to UL, went to College of Education, stayed there for a semester. I was like, I cannot do this. I cannot do it. I love it, you guys, if you're in there. It's great. It just was not for me, just because I don't know. I don't know. It was just not for me. But you guys are good, in good hands. Please continue. <laughs> and that's where I went, Dr. Grayley. And Dr. Grayley was like, she knew what was going on. She was like, let's go. We need to change it. No, she did not say it. She said, hey, if you want to come to liberal arts, you know, maybe you're interested in English. And I think somewhere in my heart, I was always interested in English. So I guess I was writing good, good things and all of that. I, were you impressed with my writing? Um, I just. <laughs> I just want her to send one to everyone. So <laughs> right after her class, one day we both, she took me um, Griffin first floor, and we went to meet uh, Miss Caroline Jurel. And anyone who you know Miss Caroline, just to know her is to love her. So we went, and uh, no um, appointment, nothing. Went there, she print out my things. And they were like, oh, you are moving here. We can take this, we can take this, we can take this. And that day we took. They took 33 of my credits from Pakistan. I went to um, Lee Hall. 
I'm just trying to think of the right buildings. <laughs> Changed my major, came to English, the rest is history. I'm graduating in December with my master's degree in English. But uh, I, f I completed my undergrad in two and a half years, um, took all the summer courses, um, everything, whatever I could do, and graduated. In, and, then, and then pandemic happened. Now we are going through this immigration process. Just started green card application right from uh, right before COVID. COVID hit, everything hit again. Um, graduated in December 2022, sent an application to grad school. This time they accepted me <laughs> and started grad school in uh, January. Oh, 2020, yeah, I graduated, 21. And now I'm in grad school, but I cannot apply for assistantship because I again, cannot work, right? So now I'm in grad school, I'm still in the bind. I'm still, uh... but anyway, that time passed. Um, I think the, the immigration process due to COVID was one of the hardest thing we went through. And I just feel like after this, you give me anything. Everything is easy after that. And uh, last summer, um, I was so thankful of um, Dean Heidi and I'm just so lucky to be working in Office of Student Engagement and Leadership as their GA and finally graduating in December. Where were we, by the way? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, what are we talking? So yes, so you know, and um, so that's what it is. So I think, I don't know, Sometimes I forget, I really literally forget that I have a green card. Um, but then now that because of all of that I went through, I can see what international students go through. I see what a lot of graduate students go through. And I was like, if one thing great came out of this, there is always something good, you know, come out of all these situations, that I got this opportunity to just get involved as an undergrad, then get involved as graduate student. And I really, you know, make some great connections, meet all of you, and just find the agency in that, in that situation that I feel like took power away from me, that now I feel like I have that strong platform provided to me through all these leadership opportunities and everything that I feel like I should, I, am, I, I definitely should use that platform to advocate for students, whether they're international, whether they are any minority students. You know, I strongly advocate for students with disabilities um, because I feel like that's, that's my job, that's my mission. And yes, so just this painting, and even the, the title that Fixing His Tie is like, a lot of time when people see me, they're like, oh, you're so funny, you're so bubbly, or you're so happy, this and that. You know, you just have to just fix your tie and make this, wear this mask and just go face whatever it is. And, but behind that um, brave face, there is so much that I think a lot of time people don't know. And um, I think it's just so important for people to know these kind of stories. And there are so many. There and I think it's not just international. I, I'm pretty sure that all of you who are sitting here, even as you know, who are here, and they have a lot of stories to share. I just think the stories are so powerful, so strong, and just to make our community inclusive and make us better people, better educators, better scholars. These stories are important, and I think those are three of my pieces of art that I selected. Yes. So Faryal, would you be okay if we opened it up to questions? I feel like I didn't leave as much space for that last week as I would have liked. So is that okay with you? Yes, 100%. All right. So if anyone has any questions in the audience, this would be a great time. I think it's been 20 years since I left Pakistan. So I think the first shock would be when I first time went to Malaysia, because that was my first time 
leaving my country, going to a new place. And um, it was my first time traveling internationally. So I think every single thing was just, I was also because I was newly married, so I was just going to this new country, you know, starting this new life. Um, and Malaysia is also, and then I went to Kelantan. So it's kind of like, you know, like Louisiana, if you come to Louisiana and if you go to Georgia, you're like, but Louisiana is a country in itself. It's so different, right? And so same thing in Malaysia, the Kelantan is a very different, very different cultural environment, just even for Malaysian. Um, so I think that was very different, uh, definitely the language and everything and everything. When I came to Atlanta, um, I think if I just if I would come first time there from Pakistan, maybe I would see a huge um, difference. But just because I went to Malaysia first, and like I said, the Malaysia is very developed country, and then if you travel to Kuala Lumpur, this and that, it's um, uh, okay. So I think okay when I went there first thing I would say when I went to like a supermarket, they were very different. So now if I go to like Albertson or something. Um, you will find similar markets in Malaysia. Now, in Pakistan, we don't have. They, recently, I went, well, recently, five years ago when I went there, they started having it. But we still have the culture of those um, shops where people go or like those uh, vegetable stalls or something. Um, so I think just having the supermarket experience was something different. Um, but by the time I came to US, it was something I was, I was used to. But it's still, Although, out, <laughs> there's always something. I have to say this, when you are outside of US and you have this, because if you see US on the TV, right? Or in the movies here and there, they always show you New York and Los Angeles and Beverly Hills. So in your mind, that's what US is. It's really fancy, like all of this. So when you come to Louisiana, and I love Louisiana, I'm not bashing Louisiana. <laughs> But a lot of international, I love now when they come because I see, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, right? <laughs> you know what, what they say if you know, you know. <laughs> now when the international student come, they always come and talk about it, just like, ah. <laughs> but like, well, like, it's okay, you will go to New York and all that. It's, it's also here, like where's the Broadway and all of that we were looking. So, but it's, I mean, you know, we have our own culture, it's beautiful, uh, but in people who are, out, are foreigners, in their mind, US is all about skyscrapers, fast cars, and just bustling cities, and nightclubs, and people are just out, right? And then you're like, no, it's not like that, especially if you're here. And then you go to New York, and then you go to New York area, which I love, I love New York area. <laughs> So I think that would be something. Um, so I know of, of like two or three girls who are international students, and I've always wanted to reach out to them, but I'm a little nervous. <laughs> What's like the best way to start a friendship with someone that doesn't come from the same background? Just go, say hello. You will be so surprised that um, they, uh, international students, you know, sometimes people get a little you might feel like that they are not, I don't know, because they come to this place and sometimes a lot of, I notice international students are very um, careful about like how to approach, am I saying the right thing, is this and that, right? So I would just say approach them, say, hey, how are you, where are you from, you know? Come to our global cafe, how about that? You start from there. <laughs> but I say just approach, what do you think, Dr. Rose? <laughs> and how, uh, and, and, and I think that's true for a lot of the immigrant experience. That's all those type of relationships are the things that help you uh, become uh, in the culture. I should be thinking about the culture to become a new person because it's those individuals that help you uh, feel that you're part of the community. It's such a beautiful story. And I I will take you to meet Miss Pat. <laughs> she would love, she loves to talk. And, and, and to encourage you, I think uh, a lot of times uh, it's fear of the unknown is what stops us from engaging in conversation. And so, um, and I like what Carla recommended, just, to, just do it. Just 
Yeah, just go approach and you will see them very friendly. They will be very happy. And I actually, I will encourage everyone. If you see international students, save hi. You know, just talk to them, people. We are in Louisiana. People talk in the lift. People talk everywhere. You know, just go talk to them the in the grocery is an store. Elevator. Elevator. Yeah. Yes. This is a great question, personally for me. So um, I am an English major, and that's my interest. Mm -hmm. I, um, I love to work um, on African American studies, slavery narratives, and everything. So for personally for me, and I think living in Malaysia and in Pakistan, one of the thing is the history of slavery in the US is something which is known. So, like, I don't know um, that people don't know. Like, I don't, obviously there will be people, but I think this is one thing that is very universally known. People know it. Now, at what extent, that's a different thing, right? Like, how people are treated here, what happened day to day, that you only learn when you really come here and live here. And so, when I um, came here, I remember reading um, The Lesson Before Dying in Dr. Uh, Grayley's class. I remember reading Beloved in Dr. Ingram's class. And you know, whenever I was reading those, those narratives, those stories, they always stood out to me. Um, I don't think anyone can compare your experience with that. I cannot compare my immigrant experience with that. But then there is something about those stories that always relates to me. And so the, I guess you just, for me personally was like, I wanted to know more. I wanted to learn more. So I was um, fortunate enough to meet Dr. Gaines at the literary festival in New Iberia. New Iberia, does a, <laughs> New Iberia has a great literary festival that I volunteer every year. Please come to it. So Dr. Gaines, they do this uh, Southern Writer Symposium. And Dr. Gaines came there. And that's what my first time meeting Dr. Gaines. Now, that time I did not read A Lesson Before Dying. That time I did not know Dr. Gaines as Dr. Gaines. But I know he's a great Southern author. And my friends were like, oh, Ernest Gaines is coming, this and that. So he was there, and he read some excerpts from, I think, uh, Ms. Pittman. And I was like, OK, that's, you know, that's really fantastic. And then I realized that we have a Gaines Center. And then our department used to go every year uh, cleaning the symmetries and everything. It was my first year as an undergrad. Um, and then I read Lesson Before Dying. And then I read Lesson Before Dying, I think, six times. And so it's just like um, educating yourself about it. And the more you educate yourself, the more you learn about it, the importance of it, and how everyone should know it. So this year, we made that effort, by the way. Uh, in February, during the Black History Month, our global cafe, we made it on a the theme of Black History Month, just with the, with the same thought that a lot of our international students they know, but they don't know what it means, what is like really the true civil rights movement is, what is going on right now, and how it is impacting the community, how we all can contribute to it and learn from it. And so we did the, our theme was um, Black History Month. We had students from uh, Ghana, Nigeria. They did the Global Cafe, but then I invited uh, Shailen Words, and she came and she talked about it. 
and we have um, Jonathan came and we had like Ruben came and you know um, so I so again like to answer your question people know it but I think it's just like doing those kind of things for international community is so important so they really know um, how important it is is that answer your question yes it does I mean it, it, it was just a Thank you. We'll take our final question from Dr. Ingram. <laughs> I think I do. Um, maybe a little bit. Um, so I guess my question um, is just, you know, thinking about the how how would you? I mean, you've, you've answered this already, but how would you move forward for us to find like a new way, a new paradigm, a new way of thinking about how to ask for so this is actually, I always struggle with this because you know, you, you fill these forms, you go in the classes, there's always a question, hometown. And I was like, where, so where is my hometown? So like, Jasim right now, my son, he writes Lafayette, I'm like, okay, <laughs> Lafayette. Um, when he went to school, because he was born in Malaysia, I remember someone asked him, where are you from? And he said, from Malaysia. And so for me, I grew up in a different city. Then my parents moved to a different place. So half of uh, my life I spent there. Then I practically started my practical life, like my life in Malaysia. I really don't know where I'm from. So I always joke that, hey, I'm this, yeah, <laughs> transnational like this, <laughs> uh, citizen. But I really don't know. I really don't know. I really don't know what my true identity is. And now that I have a green card, so does it make me, yeah, it will make, me, I'm a permanent resident. Soon I will be a US citizen, but I will never have a true identity, I think. You know, so I never, now if I really have to write where I'm from, I just write Lafayette because I just write where I am in the place, in the moment, at the time, I am from there. Because honestly, I mean, I live very important, vital years of my life, 12 years in Malaysia. My first son was born there. This is where I started my very first, my house, because I was in my mother-in-law's house and everything was, you know, run according to how she wanted it to be run. I was just there. I mean, she, she was wonderful. <laughs> but it was her house. It was not my house. Before that, it was my mother's house. 
And so my first house where I was like, this painting will go there and nobody will move it from this. <laughs> that was in Malaysia. So, and I have my, like my first child was born there. So that is a memory, right? So should I call that my hometown? Is that what Jason's hometown will be? So what about the other one who was born in Atlanta? Is that his hometown? It's so f like, I don't know. So I don't even know. I might have to just one day sit and think about this, but I just don't know what my identity is. I guess I am just a little bit of all those places that I've been to and I live. All right, so the conversation doesn't have to stop because we all have a new assignment, right? Global Cafe, Language Cafe, <laughs> we will all be going to those. Um, but before we give Faryal a round of applause, I want us all on the count of three to say good luck, Faryal, because she is about to take her master's comprehensive exam at the start of October. All right, so join me in saying good luck, Faryal. So three, two, one. <laughs> good luck, Faryal. <laughs> All now right. I better do good, no pressure. <laughs> Thank you so, so, so much. Everyone join me. Can you take a good photo if you guys don't mind? Don't give me a photo. All right, we will see you next week for the third of four weeks featuring Marcus Dunn, who this is the painter of this piece. So it'll be really interesting to hear from the artist. Um, and again, it's so cool how one artwork can creator, viewer, that's such an interesting dynamic. So thank you all for coming. See you next week. I want to take a picture with all of you, so do not.